Good morning and welcome to a time of worship together. It's good to come to worship and glorify God, but also share in fellowship with each other. It's good to have our special guest, Major Paul Hilditch, coming to lead our worship this morning. Paul will be known to some of you. He's originally from Carrick Fergus, is that right? Um, so it's good to have Paul with us. Um, Paul, Paul's... Um, works on the Salvation Army Training College, the William Booth College, and you're one of Isabel's tutors, aren't you? Some of the time. Some of the time. So if you want to know if she's being good or not, we can ask Paul. Um, but it's good to have Paul with us. Shall we um, pray before we start? Father God, we thank you so much we were able to come here to worship you this morning, to glorify your name, to give you the praise and honour that you deserve. Father, we thank you that we can share this time of fellowship with one another. And we pray for Paul, Father God, as he leads us in worship and brings your word to us. We pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing upon him and pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to receive from you and to go deeper in our relationship with you and have a greater understanding of your love and the lives that you'd have us live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So should we welcome Paul this morning. Thank you. Um, it's really good to be here, and it's great to be at the rostrum, at the microphone, and to be able to take off my mask. Uh, huge relief. Um, it's also uh, interesting to have been uh, part of an arranged marriage, because I did not invite myself, nor did you invite me. I simply said to your divisional leaders that I was in Northern Ireland for the week doing various bits of work and that if they wanted me to cover a Sunday somewhere that they could, and they said, Belfast Citadel. So that, that, that's how that worked out. So if something goes wrong today, uh, you can speak to Neil and Chris and blame them entirely. Um, if it's good, just don't say anything at all. Just say something nice to me, that would be fine. Um, right, we're going to sing together, and because you're wearing masks for singing, I really do want you to fill your lungs and to bellow as loudly as possible. Uh, we're singing song number six. It speaks about God being an eternal God uh, because he is ancient of days. So you cannot count the days of God because he is eternal. He's been around always and forever and always will be. So let's stand together and sing. Thanks.
Uh, we're going to sing another song straight away. It's 874. You can sit down. And um, as we sing this song, we are again reminded of the eternal nature of God in comparison this time to who we are. So it says, Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. There is this idea that God is a God who loves me, even though I am not worthy of his love. In my limited experience, in my limited days, he is the one who reaches out to me. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. So each time we sing the chorus, we start to take on something of the eternal nature of God because he gives us life abundant here in this life, but promises us everlasting life in the life to come. So we start to be able to number our days differently as a result. We'll sing the three verses straight through, and uh, as we do so, let's just delight ourselves in the wonder of God working in us. Thanks. Psalm 118 is a really interesting psalm. It's one that you will probably know bits of it already. Uh, some of it will be recognizable to you. Even though it was written 3,000 years ago, it also speaks about Palm Sunday. I, I know this is not Palm Sunday, just in case you're thinking that I've gone daft, um, but it nevertheless does speak about Palm Sunday. It's got a line in it that says, in the translation that we're going to read, Lord, save us. But in the original language, it would have said, Hoshienu, which we know as the word Hosanna. So we cry out to the Lord, asking him to save us. 
And there's also another line in it that says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what people cried as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. And I'm going to ask us to read the psalm responsively this morning. So if you read the words that are in bold, I'll read the words that are in italics. Um, but by all means, follow um, the reading in your own version of the Bible, although you'll find that some of the verses have been left out, just to make it that little bit shorter, a little bit snappier. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever, forever. Let Israel say, let the house of Aaron say, let those who fear the Lord say, when hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. A good psalm, I think, one that is quite positive, one that speaks about Jesus, uh, this idea of Jesus processing into Jerusalem, coming to the gates of the city, and even joining in the procession right up to the altar in the temple. It speaks there about opening the gates and processing in. I don't know if you've picked up the news of those gates in the last 24 hours, but there's been a terrorist attack just outside one of those gates. Three people are dead as a result. That's the other side of some of the stuff that we read. When we read the positive stuff, we rejoice. But we also recognize the real challenges in the world, and we reach out to the Lord, and we say, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success in his terms, not ours. Okay, you've got three pieces of card in front of you and a pen. I hope you've all got them. Okay, so take your pieces of card and your pen, and we're going to start with a yellow card. So this is not going to be a magic trick just in case you're thinking that we're heading in that direction. So you've got three cards. Start with the yellow one. You've got your pen. Easy task, first of all. I want you to write down in years only your age. So if you're 33 and a half, you've got to either be 33 or 34. Looking around, there might not be many of you. But anyway, <laughs> if you happen to be 88, you're very fortunate because no matter which way up we read it, you'll still be 88. I should say idiot. But if you're 91, could you just be careful that you are 91 and not 16? So I, I want them to be easily read and understood. Write down your name. Come on, you should have done it by now. Yeah. 
Okay, you've got your name, your age written down. The yellow cards are now going to be passed in. Now, I need a volunteer. I need a smart volunteer with a calculator on their phone. It, like, who is, who is this person? Is it Barbara? Barbara's maybe just not quite up to date with all that's on her phone, but you've got a calculator up? Okay, I need you to work out the average age. Okay, all the yellow cards to Barbara. Come on, do it. Come on, we haven't got all day. Come on, move them. Move. If, you're, if you're very self-conscious about your age, fold it in half and don't let anybody see it. Okay, and then Barbara will not know who you are. So Barbara, I need you to work out the mean average. So you're going to add them all together. You're going to divide by the number of cards that you've got. Okay, let's not make that take too long. Okay, so we've done the yellow card. We're now going to do the red card. Red card. Okay, have all the yellow cards gone in? Okay. Oh, I haven't done one. I don't, I don't even have a card. Oh, I have got a card. Okay, and um, right. Sorry, can we just... Here. There you go. Right, we have got age. Red card. Um, I want you to look around you, I want you to look around you, and I want you to write down the number of people who belong to the core. The number of people who belong to the core. Have a look around you, and write down the number of people who belong to the core. That's going to go on the red card, okay? Not just people, people that aren't here today. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, so on the red card, a number. I need a second volunteer, again, somebody with a calculator, either a calculator on your phone or if you're somebody who carries a calculator around in your handbag, I need a second volunteer, or indeed you could do it in your head. So, come on, I need somebody to volunteer to do this. Who's going to be the person who's going to volunteer to work at the average of the red card? Okay, we've got a volunteer here down in the cornets. So, sorry, what's your name? Can I have a name for the... Jane, name, name of the volunteer. Oscar. Oscar, right, okay, red cards to Oscar. Don't take all day over it, come on, red cards to Oscar. And Oscar, you're going to add all the numbers up, Mark. You're going to add all the numbers up and you're going to divide by the number of cards that you have. Okay, and you're now left with a blue card. Blue card. I hope, Barbara, you're nearly done. Good. Blue card. I want you to write down the number of people who you have met this week. The number of people who you have met this week. Now, if you got onto a bus and you didn't speak to anybody on the bus, you're not counting the people on the bus. But if you got on the bus and you nodded to everybody or said hello to everybody the way you would do in Northern Ireland, I live in London, it's different. Um, so you can count all the people on the bus. If you have been in the house all week and you haven't seen anybody, well then the number is zero. But if you have spoken to people on the phone, count them in. If you've messaged people on social media, count them in. So count the number of contacts you have had this week. And if you've walked into the hall, people are having their own agenda over here. If you've walked into the hall this morning and you've ignored everybody, then you can't count anybody. If you've walked into the hall this morning and spoken to everybody, you can count everybody. So put the number down on the blue card and I need another volunteer with a calculator or who can do it in their head. I'm feeling as if this could be a wee bit of pressure for you. So who's my third volunteer? Tell me. Third volunteer, please. I need a third volunteer. It's, it's like an auction. Third volunteer. What's your name? Pardon? Hamid. Okay, blue cards to Hamid. You're going to just count. I don't want an average. I want a total. So just add them together, all the blue cards.
I know that that's created a bit of pressure amongst you this morning, but there you go. What I should have asked was who's the core treasurer and who's the core secretary, because like, they're dealing with numbers all the time. They should have a calculator to hand, ever. The core treasurer's in America, that's ridiculous. Right. Okay, here's the conundrum. Here's the conundrum. We want to count in. And I think that you will know what that feels like. So place yourself in the comfortable place where you are counted in and you will know what that feels like. You will know how that feels inside. So I come into an unfamiliar Salvation Army building. I have been in your building before, but I haven't been in this building on a Sunday. I've only been in this building during the week. But I do remember the old building and I remember the one before that. I'm that old. Um, 50 years ago, I believe, almost, um, since that building was uh, destroyed. Um, so interesting. But I feel comfortable here this morning for a number of reasons. Um, I'm a Salvation Army officer, so that makes me feel a wee bit more comfortable here. I've got a reason to be here. I've got a reserved seat, even though I'm not going to be sitting on it very much. Um, so I feel very comfortable. I know how it is to be counted in. Here's an image that I'm rather fond of. It, it's slightly, slightly weird. It's a very, very tiny baby. It's a very tiny baby being held in somebody's hands. But maybe you know something of that experience as well. Either holding a baby that is your baby, or maybe you know what it feels like to be held. And I'm not necessarily meaning as a baby, but just one of those moments where your heart is broken uh, and you've been held. Uh, and so we feel valued and included and integrate it. But I would guess that we also know what this feels like. To be left alone, to be isolated, to not be integrated, to be segregated, to be isolated, to be unvalued. We will know what that feels like. And I might even go as far as to say that we might even know what this feels like. To be bullied, to be treated as if we are vile, to be treated as nothing more than dirt, as less than human. And those experiences will come our way at different times for different reasons. And living in a society here in Northern Ireland that is highly segregated still in many ways, you will know what that feels like when you find yourself as the outsider. And it's not just the sectarian thing, it kicks in, in all sorts of ways. So every now and again, instead of being counted in, we find ourselves being counted out. And that's what I want to concentrate on this morning. Those times when we feel counted in, and those times when we feel counted out. Now here's the results. Uh, first of all, can you give us the average age of the core? 56. Wow. 56, look around you and delight to yourselves in the fact that the average age of the core is 56. Now, if you're feeling much older than 56, then wallow in that idea. If you're feeling much younger than that, then wallow in that idea. And I am once again mesmerized by the fact that I'm round about the average age of the core, give or take a couple of years. I'm still in my 50s, but it's 58. Um, so so that's, that's interesting. But you know, every now and again, people will be discounted because of their number of years, either because they're too young or too old, and therefore you don't fit in, you don't belong, you're excluded, you're counted out. You know what it feels like to be with somebody of your own age group. As you get older, I think your age group expands. But when you're younger, somebody who's 15 feels a lot younger than you when you're 16. 
So it kicks in in different ways. Average age of the core, 56. Now, let's discover how many people we think belong to the core. So that's over here. How, what's the average answer to belonging to the core? 48. 48 people belonging to your core. Now, there will be people who will dispute that number, and I have to say that I led you slightly astray because I told you to look around. So when you looked around this morning, you maybe did a quick count up of how many people are actually here, and you forgot to count in the people who are not here this week. But understand what it is that you've done. I led you in that direction, but we've made a mistake. We've counted people out because they're not here. I said to Mark, can you do the answer in a completely different way? I said, can you be as generous as you possibly can be in terms of how many people you're going to count in? Um, think about the number of people who come into the building. Think of the number of people who you con connect with as a Salvation Army officer. You came up with, what was the number again? 48. You came up with? I've got about 250. 250. I've counted all the children that we haven't seen for a long time. 250. Ten That's toddlers. a very different number. Ten toddlers, um, Wednesday, um, Tuesday, Bible study. Um, yeah, all the other groups that go on. So that's a different calculation. Now, I know I led you astray, and I also prompted him to answer the question in a different way. But can you see what happens there? Now, what's the total number of people who you have been in contact with this week? Um, 4,238. 4, I'm not very good with numbers. 4,238, is that what you said? Sorry, I, I have a problem with my memory when it comes to numbers. It's a real struggle. So. That's a different number again. I wonder if we could consider that those people sort of belong. Because if we're serious about what we do when we go away from worship, those people sort of belong. And that's a very, very large number. A large number of people who have encountered you as the people who worship here together. If you have any ministry at all, it's to over 4,000 people in an ordinary week. And that's during COVID things that are restricting the number of people who we contact. Those numbers, I think, are truly fascinating. Let's pray. Father God, today we pray for this meeting. We pray for each other. We pray for our many concerns. But Father, we come to you because you count us in and you allow us to bring our prayers to you. So Lord, we declare that your love endures forever. We declare that you are the one who does save us. You're the one who guides us and gives us success. We are grateful, Lord, for all that you do for us. But as we count our blessings today, we ask for more. We ask more from you for the days that lie ahead. And as we count our days, may we count them correctly as we look to you, may we try to understand, even if only fragmentally, your nature, how you are eternal and beyond the things that concern us. Father, we make these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I've done a bit of talking already. When it comes to the message, it's not going to last for long. Uh, but today's Bible readings, just to give you a wee preview, um, it's about these calculations. 99 plus 1 is 100, isn't that right? Okay, 9 and 1 is 10, is that right? 
okay, one and one is two, uh, and therefore I'm going to give you all a smiley face because you've got your sums right this morning. And we are this morning going to say that I want to be counted in and that you want to be counted in, and we're going to wallow in the wonder of that quite soon. But first of all, we're going to listen to the band. Thanks. moments where you're not sure whether to clap or not. In our core, we just do it now because we've only got one meeting on a Sunday, so you used to clap like on a Sunday afternoon, but then the band would never play on a Sunday morning. So yeah, we just clap, but thank you very much. It is a good thing uh, to praise the Lord. We're going to sing together again about Jesus. We're going to sing that there's no other name but this name and no other name will do. I forgot to tell the musicians about the red triangle that appears at the end of the song. So you may want to note that, because I always sing songs straight through. So, um, do you need to stand up? Do you want to stand up? Okay, well then stand up and sing. Um, the song number, if you're needing it, is 96. Thanks. <laughs>
Thank you. Do sit down. Um, it's a good song. I like it. I did change the words slightly, did you notice? Well, that's fine then. One of the things that interests me is how we would never dream of saying some things from the platform, but we sing them. We regularly sing about how Jesus comes for men. We sing that, but we would never say it. And personally, when I see it in a song, it rankles, so I change the words. So it used to say that Jesus came for all men. And I didn't like that because I wouldn't say it even though we regularly sing it. I just mention it. Because I don't want young women to be singing words that mean that they are excluded, that they have been counted out instead of being counted in. Um, my mother sends her greetings to those of you who know her. Um, when it comes to counting, she is 99. And she will be 100 on the 25th of March. So we've got a lot of exciting stuff happening next year. Um, we've got my mother's 100th birthday and my daughter's wedding. So um, wonderful stuff going on. She would have loved me to have brought her with me this morning, which I wasn't willing to do. Um, so she's at home because there's no meeting today at the core at Larne. And um, interesting how that makes her feel in terms of counting in or counting out. I give you the opportunity this morning to testify. The song speaks about Jesus coming to bring about change, and I would like to hear some testimonies this morning about how Jesus brings about change. If you've got a testimony to give, I'd like you to give it. And I would like you to give it in such a way that it gives the honor to the Lord. If there aren't any, we'll move on, but let's see what happens. I very often I would say like can get us down. And when you're, not, when you're feeling down, you see things in a different light and you see things in a different way. And the way you're looking at things are not necessarily the right things the way things actually are, but you see them in a different way. That has been my experience over the last while back, a few weeks or months back. I have been feeling and seeing things in a different way that I should have been looking at them, and I've been feeling a bit down because of that. But when I have been reading scripture, I have realised that no matter how I feel, the changes that uh, take place in me are not the changes that I make, but they're the changes that God does for me. And it's him that um, sets, me, sets my feet again on the right path and takes away the, the feelings that I would have had of being maybe counted out and not counted in. Uh, but he has made me realise that I am always counted in, in his eyes. Yeah, sometimes counting yourself out. Yeah, thanks for taking your mask off, I recognise you now. <laughs> yeah, that business about how we sometimes paint ourselves, right? Yeah. My uh, testimony this morning is uh, slightly different from Marie's. I went shopping yesterday morning. I got my shopping, I packed the car, and got home, and I had no handbag. I said, what have I done? And I remember leaving my handbag on the trolley outside a shop and I thought I'll go back to this shop and see so I go back to the shop I'm sorry no handbag and I don't know whether I was white or what was wrong but they offered me a cup of tea and one of the girls said I'll go to the security and see if one was handed in and I don't think I've ever prayed as much in my life because everything was in my handbag the girl, the girl came back from the security and she said, one has been handed in, but I can't claim it, you've got to go. And I couldn't get over two strangers, one making me a cup of tea, another one holding a, a security spot for me to park, 
And it was just God in the middle of it. I got inside and my handbag was there. And I had to explain to the, the lady what my handbag was like. Fortunately, it's a bag I've had for about 10 years. So I knew what it was like. I knew exactly what was in it. And I was able to say to her, God had um, been in charge of all this. Not a thing was missing in my bag. And all I can do is give God the thanks and the glory. Because without him, I doubt that bag would have been handed back to me. And at the minute, I just want to praise God for his goodness, not only in the bag, but in my life. God has um, grown closer, should I say, I've grown closer with God as I've got older. I don't always feel counted in, but I definitely, definitely am one of God's children. Uh, and presumably at some point you counted how many things were in your handbag? Counting them in, one by one. You said everything was in your handbag, so like I'm wondering what number we would put to that, but uh, it's a different matter altogether. Thanks very much for those words. Here is a gorgeous song that speaks about Jesus as a shepherd. I don't have a number for you in the songbook because it's not in the current songbook, but it was in the previous songbook. And the tune that we use is the tune of the meeting of the waters. So if you know that tune, then you'll be able to sing along with the words of this song. And in order to make uh, the words fit the music, we repeat the last two lines. So let's just sit back and enjoy the gorgeousness of these words the beautifulness of the music as we sing together. Thanks. for singing well. Um, I hope you agree with me that it's a gorgeous song. Um, you may be able to find an old songbook lying around somewhere and be able to join in with singing it to your heart's content at home as you relish some of the emotion that is carried um, in the words of the song. I'd like to read to you from Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells three stories and I'm starting at verse 3. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 3, these stories will probably be familiar to all of you. 
Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Amen. I, I'm stopping there deliberately because I'm going to then go on to tell the rest of the story in a minute or two. But that's how the three stories essentially present themselves. And I want to look at those three stories briefly this morning. I'm going to have to keep on going back with the PowerPoint in order to be able to tell the story. So here we have a shepherd looking for lost sheep. And the traditional understanding of this story is that God is a shepherd. God is a shepherd, and when we get lost, he goes searching after us until he finds us to be able to restore us back into the community of the sheep. God is a good shepherd who counts us in. Great. Second story. When it comes to the second story, commentators are a little bit more reluctant to make the obvious statement. But I'm going to make it this morning. I'm going to tell you that God is a housewife. If God is a good shepherd, then God is a tidy housewife who, when she loses one coin out of ten, goes searching for that lost coin until she finds it and restores it back into its rightful place. God is a housewife who counts us in instead of counting us out. And God is a good father who, when we go astray, welcomes us home. So there's the standard reading of these three stories, and that's sort of fine. But I've got a problem. Let me explain to you the problem. First of all, in terms of shepherds, I'm led to believe that a Middle Eastern shepherd 2,000 years ago, if they had a sheep that kept on leaving the flock, 
would go and find that sheep somewhere away from the rest of the flock and break its legs and bring it back so that it could not go astray. And when its legs had healed, it would learn the lesson of staying with the flock. I'm I'm not very happy with the idea of God being that sort of a shepherd. Maybe he does teach us those lessons, and maybe that's fine, but I feel a little bit uncomfortable with it. And as I've already said, if you go to commentaries on this chapter, you'll discover that traditional commentaries of 10, 20 odd years ago and more will be very happy with the idea of God being shepherd and father, but uncomfortable with the idea of God being a housewife. So how we deal with these stories becomes a little bit problematic. But here's my real problem. Let's have a think about this father in this story. This is not a father who, like the shepherd and the housewife, goes searching for the lost son. Instead, he stays at home. Okay, he's watching for the lost son, but he doesn't go searching for the lost son. And when the lost son comes back, the rest of the story tells us that the father remembers some things and forgets some other things. He remembers to call the jewelry shop. He remembers to call the tailors. He remembers to bring in the caterers, but he forgets to tell the other son that his brother has returned. So this is a father that I am unconvinced is one that we should interpret as God. I've often been confused by the story. I've been um, a little bit niggled by the story. And I made a discovery a couple of weeks ago. Somebody sent me a YouTube video and I watched it and I listened to what the woman was saying and I thought, oh my goodness, that's what the story's about. I started at verse three Instead, let's start again the Bible reading at verse 1. This is the context of the three stories. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And like a bolt of lightning, I suddenly thought, Ah, I think I've maybe got it. These stories are stories that in that context make an awful lot of sense. So you can keep the traditional understanding of the stories by all means. I don't want to take that away from you, but I want to at least add in this interpretation. There are tax collectors and sinners who are going to listen to Jesus And the religious people are muttering. They are muttering, this man, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They are muttering because Jesus is counting in instead of counting out. And these religious people would prefer it if Jesus was to count out instead of counting in. So this YouTube video just simply said, The story is just about counting. It's just about counting. It's about the fact that if you count up to 99 and you know it should get to 100, you need to count in that one. Do not be content with 99. Go go and find that other one. If you count up to 9 and you know it should be 10, then go searching for that other one and make it 10. And when it's one instead of two, do that counting quite carefully. So I said to you earlier on that every now and again we will know how it feels to be comfortable. Maybe it's because we're with family or we're at the hall or we're in a familiar setting. But I also said that all of us will know what it's like to feel uncomfortable. I said to Jim, so were you at Seaview last night? I drove along the motorway and I saw the floodlights and I thought of him. He also talked about his brother who's a Glen Torn supporter. 
so you definitely want to count them out. They don't want to be a part of that crowd. And you don't necessarily want them to be a part of that crowd. It's interesting how that works. It's interesting how it works in all sorts of ways. So work that one out for yourself, but think carefully of why it is that sometimes you feel comfortable and why it is that you sometimes feel uncomfortable. And maybe it is that you feel intensely comfortable because you know the wonder of God being a good shepherd. Maybe not quite the shepherd described here, or indeed the shepherd that I described earlier, but a good shepherd who takes care of your handbag when it's lost, who changes your thinking because your thinking has become a little bit corrupted. But God also, a housewife, who tidies up the mess of our everyday lives and brings our orderliness to be obvious so that we can worship the Lord in the orderliness of our minds. It may be that some of us are specifically struggling today with physical concerns in terms of health and mental health concerns as well. Here is a God who comes to assist us to support us, to nourish us. And here is a God who, like a good father, like a good father, who does not forget, but actively remembers and knows us by name, knows us better than we know ourselves, and who welcomes us home. So maybe the stories are just about counting about how God himself counts us in and those times when we sometimes count ourselves out or count other people out. Early on Monday morning, I was going off to the railway station and I saw a woman wearing a night dress, shorts, slippers, a very short night dress, by the way, and an Aaron jumper. I was bewildered, absolutely bewildered. I thought, who is she? What's she doing? And in those moments, I counted her out. Do you understand what I mean? I have no idea what was going on with her. Maybe she needed somebody to go and say, are you all right? Totally out of place in that context. I, I, I've spent the week doing various different things, and each time I just keep on thinking about what I'm going to be saying to you this morning. I've counted things like, how many miles is it? How long will it take me to get to? But I've also done that thing of sometimes counting people in, and then sometimes not getting it quite right, and effectively counting them out. So I leave that challenge with you this morning in terms of how you count in and how you count out. I leave with you the idea that God always counts us in and is desperate to count us in. And I leave with you the idea that every now and again in our religiousness, we will count out, like the people who are muttering here about Jesus. But in our good spirituality, we will count in. And when we do it, like it says in the Bible reading, there will be great rejoicing in heaven over someone who repents, whether that be us ourselves or whether it is somebody else who is prompted to do that by our actions. The thousands of people who you have met in the last week the thousands of people who you are going to meet in the coming week who desperately need you to count them in and to prompt them to think differently, to act differently, 
to be different as a result of their encounter with you and ultimately their encounter with the Lord. So here's a song. It's a song that says that sometimes we get it wrong. We count out. We count ourselves out. But there is one who always counts us in. But some people don't quite get that, so we have to count them in so that they can lift their eyes and see the God who sees them and who counts them in. Do you sometimes feel that no one truly knows you and that no one understands or really cares? Through his people, God himself is close beside you and through them he plans to answer all your prayers. Someone cares. We'll sing together. It's song 10. Thanks. The meeting has been about counting. We sang a song at the beginning that spoke of God as the ancient of days, too many days to count. We sang a song about us sharing with God for eternity, a time beyond our understanding that no one can count. We sang a song that talks about there being no other name but Jesus. It is the only one name that counts. We sang a song that said, his lost one again, the good shepherd who comes seeking his lost one again. We have just sung a song about some one cares. The whole meeting has been about counting about counting in and not counting out. I told you about my mother who is 99, who in March will be a hundred. You see, it's all about counting. It's about counting in. It's my tradition to pronounce the benediction and then to have a closing song. So let me give you the benediction. The benediction speaks to you individually. It says you, but actually it means not you together, but you individually. Hear these familiar words. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And we all say, Amen. So therefore, we turn to a closing song, which is 861. So you can count your way through the songbook to find 861, or you can simply stand with me and sing the words that are on the screen, because it is Christ and only Christ, Christ alone, because we're still counting, and He counts us in as we rejoice in His ministry to us. Let's stand together and sing. Thank you very much. Please sit down. It's been good to be with you today. Um, thanks also for use of your platform and so on.